The Blue Card is a not-for-profit organization assisting Holocaust survivors in need. Now, the organization recently lost its podcast, providing the Holocaust survivors a voice. The interviews highlight their life's challenges as well as their triumphs. Joining us now to share more is licensed psychologist, author, and filmmaker, Dr. Eva Fogelman. And we thank you, Dr. Fogelman, for being with us. Thank you, Darren, for having me on the show and being able to share the work that the Blue Card is doing and bringing the voice of, of Holocaust survivors, which we hope will also have implications for other people that are historically traumatized. Yeah. And when we talk about the Blue Card, your organization is really uh, helping those Holocaust survivors in a variety of different ways. And one of the ways that I know that you're doing is you're helping to give them a voice. And so share with us about why it's important for Holocaust survivors to have a voice, particularly at a time like this. Well, uh, Holocaust survivors felt very uh, victimized uh, for many years. So it's very difficult, very different to have a historical trauma as opposed to being just persecuted uh, you know, by a parent or sexually abused. Uh, this was a, uh, a trauma that people experienced for, uh, for six years, some of them for 12 years if they came from, uh, if they came from, uh, from Germany. And when they first came to the United States, uh, they were seen as people who were, that there was something wrong with them mentally. They must be disturbed in some way. And so they were not embraced uh, in any way. Nobody wanted to hear their stories. Everybody said, oh, you just got to America. This is a new country. Forget about what had happened. So it's only since I would say probably like the mid eighties, uh, which is we're talking about two generations, 40 years later, that Holocaust survivors even began to share what their experiences were. And as Holocaust survivors get older, uh, they begin to uh, talk more about the past because we have more long-term memory than short-term memory when we get older. Uh, so this has become something very important because Holocaust survivors who have never shared their story before uh, are beginning to share their story. Also, as we, uh, as any people get older, uh, one of the things that happens is that people want to feel like they are leaving something behind, that they are teaching the next generation. And so one of the things we're trying to teach with uh, the podcast that we began with the blue uh, card, uh, Stories of Holocaust Survivors Overcoming Historical Trauma, is to show um, not only the Holocaust survivors themselves, that indeed, yes, some of them had difficult lives uh, adjusting, certainly the first couple of years till they found a, a place that would take them because no country wanted to take refugees. I mean, today we're seeing, you know, two million people from the Ukraine are being embraced. After the Holocaust, um, uh, Holocaust survivors were in displaced persons camps. Uh, for some of them for six years before they found a country that would take them so that they can begin a uh, so that they can begin a new life. Yeah. And, hey, uh, me, I didn't mean to cut you, but I wanted to ask you about this because when we talk about Holocaust survivors and telling the story of Holocaust, we know that there's a lot of misinformation out there. And I know that one of the things that you talked about is that you want to be able to kind of like debunk some of that misinformation and be able to give clarity to what it's like for a Holocaust survivor and the families of those. Right. So one of the things that is the misinformation is that, you know, everybody's saying, oh, if you've been traumatized, you have post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and one of the things we need to understand about post-traumatic stress disorder, yes, there's about 50% of the people who have traumatic uh, stress disorder symptoms, uh, certainly nightmares, uh, depression, uh, anomie, which is you know not wanting to socialize with people, using isolation as a, uh, as a defense, or being triggered. Uh, for Holocaust survivors, if they see a policeman, they may run across the street because 
who took them out of their houses in the middle of the night to uh, be deported to ghettos to concentration camps. And uh, so what we need to understand, for example, about post-traumatic stress disorder is that, first of all, you don't have it every day of your life after you have been traumatized. It is sporadic. There are triggers that, you know, bring it on and you have times where, you know, it's in, it's in abeyance and you're functioning normally. And sometimes you may have a trigger and it may just last a couple of hours. Uh, one of the things that I tell people, of course, is not to watch too much of the of television during this time, uh, because this is something uh, when we're seeing, you know, the killings in the Ukraine, uh, when we're seeing the refugees, I tell people don't particularly Holocaust survivors, uh, other people who've been historically uh, traumatized. I, uh, whether we're talking about Bosnia, whether we're talking about people in the uh, Sudan, uh, I say, you know, don't watch too much of the scene, you know, just read about it in the paper so that indeed uh, you will not, uh, you will not get triggered. So even but you, if somebody... Uh, but, but I'm sorry, but you yourself, when you talk about being, uh, uh, being a family of a Holocaust survivor, you have these triggers yourself, right? Because when you look at what you see right now with Russia and the Ukraine, you're finding a lot of similarities. Can you share a little bit about what it is that you see that, that, that really resonates with you? Sure, so one of the things is my seeing the, uh, the refugee people trying to escape from the Ukraine and trying to find some kind of refuge. Uh, my mother came from a small town not far from Warsaw, when the Germans invaded September 1, 1939, a few days later, my mother got on a horse and bus with her uh, mother and father and five siblings, and uh, they kept going east, uh, and they ended up in Bialystok, where they were part of hundreds and hundreds of other uh, people who were escaping Poland, and they all slept on the floor in, in synagogues. They hardly had any food, and then they had to keep going uh, east. Uh, anyway, they had a very long journey. They were in a uh, labor camp in Russia. They had to go back, and then eventually they were in Siberia and western part. And um, obviously, seeing what's happening is triggering my own feelings and my own images of what it was like for for my mother and uh, my mother and her family. And you have to remember that as they were going east, they were constantly dodging the, the bombs that were being thrown. And they were just one of the lucky ones that didn't get hit by, uh, by a bomb. Yeah. And, uh, and people who remained in my mother's town in Vishkov, uh, most of them were killed because uh, the synagogue was set on fire, the schools were set on fire. And uh, and very few survive from uh, from that town. If you're just joining us, we're talking about the blue card. Dr. Eva Fogel, uh, Eva Fogelman is helping us out with uh, letting us know a little bit more about what is going on in terms of providing services for Holocaust survivors, and then at the same time also being able to tell their stories. So, Dr. Fogelman, before we go, uh, tell people. Uh, where they can go to be able to latch on to this podcast uh, and how they can lock in. Uh, they can see it. It's um, on uh, spot, uh, Spotify. Uh, Spotify and one other one. Uh, and I think we're going to hopefully maybe try to get it also on uh, on YouTube uh, as, as as well. And we're trying to get all kinds of survivors who came from from the different countries and ha and we've had all kinds of uh, different uh, walks of life. And not just to show the, the resilience of the people, um, but also to show what it took for them to become resilient after having uh, lost their families, after having lost their home, after having lost their language, uh, and having to begin all over again. And one of the things we have to remember is that a lot of them uh, were, uh, were young children uh, who lost completely their, their teen years and, um, and what we're seeing is that obviously those who were able to survive with mother and father uh, and were able to get a education uh, despite the years that they lost uh, were able to cope better than those people who uh, 
who didn't have a parent that they uh, that survived the war, and those who weren't able to um, to have an education, who completely missed out on uh, on those years. Yeah. Well, Dr. Fogelman, I want to thank you so much for sharing with us the story. Uh, there are some challenges and there also are some triumphs. Of course, you'll be able to share those with people on the Holocaust podcast. So thank you so much for being with us. And uh, we look forward to talking to you soon. Uh, thank you very much. And I think that uh, lots of other people who've been historically traumatized, not only in this country, but we're talking about African-Americans and Native Americans, will also be able to uh, relate to what it takes to, uh, to begin life anew. Yeah. Well, I want to let our viewers know if you want more information, don't hesitate to go to her website at evafogelman.com. And then also the bluecardfund.org. Those are two websites where you can get more information. Now, we want you to stay with us because we do have more show. We're coming right back with more open right after this. <laughs> 